ding dong of the scratches. Good Monday slash Tuesday morning to all the children. I am broadcasting to you from what I am calling the bunker down in Mr. O'Neill's basement. You can see I've got my classroom behind me. Very sophisticated. And uh, these days I feel like I'm living in a bunker. I don't see sunlight usually until late afternoon, being down here all day. But uh, I'm getting used to it. So we only have, I think, two weeks left now. I've lost count. I believe so. Two, two and a half weeks, something like that. So uh, you guys are doing great. Hang in there. We're almost done. And I'm being very optimistic that we'll be back in school next fall. I am hoping. I am praying. I am doing my, you know, how you used to do um, the snow day dance when you wanted school to be canceled for snow days. Now I'm, I'm doing like the uh, coronavirus dance, I guess, hoping that we will have school and the cancellation will be over. So we shall see. But uh, this week we're going to move the Cold War forward and we're going to talk today about something I think that's fascinating. And that is the nuclear arms race. So last week on Friday, specifically, in our lesson, uh, we said 1949 slash 1950. You know, that was a big year because a lot of events occurred that really intensified the Cold War. And one of the big events was that you guessed it, Abdallah. You're so good. Even from far away, I can see your smiling face. Yes, the Soviet Union tested their first atomic bomb. And you can imagine what the United States response was. It was like, oh, hell no. And why did they say that, Thompson? Yes, you're right. They said that because now, hey, Joe Stalin, we know he's crazy already. He done killed, you know, 20 million of his own people. Now he's got the bomb and they can drop it on Washington. They could drop it on New York. They could drop it on Los Angeles. They could hit us with it. And we know, we knew what the bomb could do because we used it. We were the only nation in history to use it. So that's not good that they got it. And what that's going to do is it's going to set off, it's going to trigger something called a nuclear arms race. So in the cartoon, you can see these two crazy cartoon characters uh, running with, with weapons in their hands, like they're racing. And uh, the man on the left was the man who took over after the death of Joseph Stalin. His name was Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev. And on the right, I don't know if you could tell who that American president was, guesses. Anyone? Anyone? You got it. You are brilliant, Ledbetter. Brilliant. His name is John F. Kennedy. And maybe you're aware of him because of uh, the assassination. It's kind of infamous. But uh, they were the leaders of the two superpowers during the Cold War. And the cartoon is showing how each side was trying to develop more and more nuclear weapons. So uh, you might ask yourself, what is the purpose of building up all these nuclear weapons? Uh, because if like we use it on the Soviet Union, they're going to fire back at us. And that is true. Uh, we call this MAD. It was a policy that both sides kind of followed during the Cold War to keep us from actually fighting a nuclear war. And the idea is mutually assured destruction. So both sides have their finger on the button. The button, Milligan, is what releases the missile that attacks the other side. So I know if I press that red button, my missile is going to go straight towards the Soviet Union. They have satellites. They can see radar. They can see this stuff coming at them. So as soon as they see the American missiles coming at them, guess what they're going to do, Lydia Graves? Yes, you guessed it. They're going to press their button. And each side is going to send missiles at the other side and then Boom, kaboom, pass down, destruction on both sides. So 
we don't want to fire at them because we know that that's going to cause our destruction. They will fire back. And that's the balance of terror. Each side knew that it would be just it would be destroyed if it launched its weapons. And that's what really kept us out of uh, like a hot war, an all out nuclear war during the Cold War. OK, it sounds kind of crazy, but um, you're going to see some numbers in a, in a minute. And we just kept on producing more and more nuclear bombs because we had to maintain that balance. Each side knew that if what the other side got more nukes, they were more likely to use them because there was no balance. And they could potentially win that nuclear war if they had an edge. So just to give you an idea, in 1946, uh, well, let's see. How many nukes do you think there were in 1946? You tell me, Cora Hargrove. You're brilliant. Nine. Uh, and guess who had all of those nukes in 1946? Go ahead. Guess. Yes, freckle face Chase Marion. The United States. We had all of the nukes in the entire world in 1946. 1950. Whoa, what happened? 400 nukes. That's because Joseph Stalin and the Soviets got their first nuke in 1949, and then all hell broke loose. We were trying to keep up with them. And then, as you can see, every so many years, like 1956, we got 2,000, 1960, three and a half thousand, 1970, 7,000. By 1980, we had over 18,000. And near the end of the Cold War, 23,000 nukes. And that's for both the Soviets and the United States. We had enough nukes to destroy all life on this planet several times over. Several. Matter of fact, again, it, had we went into a nuclear war with the Soviet Union, all life would have been completely destroyed on this planet. And it wouldn't have taken 23 nukes to do it. You know, a couple hundred, probably less than that, would have wiped out all life. Nothing would have survived except maybe cockroaches and Eamon Cantlin. Everything else would have been wiped out. So on this graph, you can see the U.S. in blue and the Soviet Union in red. And you should notice um, on the left, going vertical up, that's the number of nukes. And then I'll get this out of the way here so you can see the bottom. Those are the years. And uh, the peak years are really in the 80s. And then all of a sudden, in the late 80s, the numbers just drop like they fall off a cliff. And why is that? You got it. The Cold War is going to end in 1991. So there is no more nuclear arms race because there is no more Soviet Union. Spoiler alert. The United States is going to win this war. The Soviet Union is going to collapse in 1991. And I'll explain that later next week. Okay. So... Uh, just to give you an idea of how destructive these bombs became over the course of the, the uh, Cold War, that little itty bitty dot in the middle of that that circle, that, that designates the bomb known as Fat Man. Fat Man was the bomb. All these bombs have really cool code names. Uh, Fat Man was called Fat Man because it was unlike Little Boy, which was dropped on Hiroshima. Fat Man was big and round. And uh, that's the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Now, that little circle kind of uh, demonstrates the destructive power of that bomb. Uh, by the peak of the Cold War, the biggest bomb that was ever made uh, was Tsar Bomba. That's in red. Now, Fat Man was a 20 kiloton bomb. It basically was the equivalent of uh, 20 kilotons of TNT. Tsar Bomba was 50 megaton. That's 50 million tons of TNT, children. That's all the bombs dropped in World War II multiplied by thousands. All right. Um, so in this little graph, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, those tiny little mushroom clouds. That's Fat Man and Little Boy, the bombs dropped on Japan. And look at Tsar Bomba to the right. On... Unbelievable. Uh, so the Soviets were really into making big, big bombs. We never produced a bomb that big because 
our missile technology was better. So we could, with a missile, we could be more accurate with placing that bomb. If we're going to hit Moscow, we're going to hit downtown Moscow. The Soviets weren't as precise, so they might have a, a missile, but, you know, it's headed towards downtown New York, but it hits, you know, I don't know, Staten Island, right? So they had to make their bombs big. So if they're not on target, they're going to take out everything, you know, in a 50 mile radius. All right. So, um, one thing that changes the uh, nuclear arms race quite a bit is the launch of something called Sputnik, Sputnik 1. And Americans saw this on their news programs, sitting in their living rooms, eating their TV dinners in 1957. News came over that the Soviets launched the first satellite into space. And it was probably the size of this right here, this little children's little uh, toy ball. And uh, this was the, the first man-made satellite. Well, all satellites are man-made into space. And we lost it. You know, I mean, Americans are sitting there watching this and then they saw this news and like, oh, hell no, they got a satellite. Why do we care if they launch this into space? Because from this, now it's a satellite right? It's way up in, in the atmosphere. The idea is if they could launch a satellite thousands of miles into space, thousands of miles into space, that means they could potentially put a bomb on a missile. And instead of launching it into space, they could launch that to Washington, D.C. So this really intensified the nuclear arms race. And this, uh, led to the development of these ICBMs. And what they stand for is intercontinental ballistic missiles. And you're probably thinking, that's a whole lot of multi-syllable words, Mr. Neal. Can you please break it down? Because I don't understand that. I will, Lynette Scrutchins. Intercontinental ballistic missiles are just missiles that are capable of flying from one continent to another. And... The Soviet Union and the United States, of course, started putting nuclear bombs called warheads on those missiles. And they're capable of hitting targets thousands of miles away in just a few minutes. So very little time for warning. Once those things were in the air, you had minimal time to, to get out of the way. All right. Um, and what made them more dangerous is they could be launched not just from like... Um, the Soviet Union, but each side, the Soviets and the United States, put these missiles on submarines. They're called nuclear submarines. So this could be the coast of the United States in the picture, and check it out. We've got a sub just off the coast of New York Harbor. Now those missiles could hit New York within a minute, two minutes, if they're that close. Um, one submarine had enough nuclear warheads on board to destroy the entire North American continent, every major city in the United States and Canada, one submarine could do that. 24 missiles per sub. Each missile carried up to eight nuclear bombs. Do the math. That's 192 warheads per ship. Take out a whole continent. Damn. That looks something like out of the Avengers or Iron Man or something. So that would be uh, what a, a warhead looks like, the multiple warhead. It looks like a bouquet of flowers, except they're deadly warheads. And uh, what they do is they all have a target, so they separate and they rain down on different cities. Fun fact, children. During the Cold War, Akron, Ohio was on the Soviet Union's hit list. I believe we were number eight. So they had a hit list of all the targets they were going to take out if we ever had a nuclear war. And, of course, you had Washington, D.C., New York City, the Biggies, Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, um, and they had Akron. And you're thinking, why Akron? Well, of course, everyone knows we have Chapel Hill Mall. That's a little joke. Uh, back then, Akron was the rubber capital of the world. And in World War II, you know, we supplied all of the Allies with rubber for Jeeps and other materials that are used in fighting the modern war. And uh, 
course, they're going to take out the industrial cities. Pittsburgh produces steel, so they were on the hit list. Um, but yeah, Akron was was big, um, big target. And I'll show you some uh, fallout shelters we had in the city here in a minute. Okay, so things are getting out of control. By 1968, the nations get together, and uh, United Nations really kind of spearheaded this, and, and they got all the nations to sign something called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Can you say that 10 times fast? Try it out, kids. Uh, what this meant, basically, is that these nations who signed it, they promised to stop spreading nuclear technology to other nations. So... Like in 1968, there were, I think, five nations that had the bomb. And uh, all of these nations said, well, we're not going to give our allies technology. We have the bomb, but we're going to make sure it doesn't spread to other nations. Because the idea was the more nations that have the bomb, well, you're more likely to have a nuclear war because who knows who's going to have a crazy dictator. And they may actually push that button and trigger a worldwide you know, nuclear conflict. So... You're probably asking, hey, Mr. O'Neill, I was just thinking, what nations currently possess nukes? That's a great question, Trevor Ingham, and I'm about to show you. First one was, of course, United States. We got that bomb in 1945. The code name was Trinity. Russia got their first bomb in 1949, and its code name was Joe One, as in Joseph Stalin. They named their bomb after their bloodthirsty dictator. Great Britain got their first bomb in 1952, and they codenamed it Hurricane. France tested their first bomb in 1960, and it was codenamed Blue Jerboa. What in the hell was a Jerboa? Uh, Jerboa is a uh, it's a desert rodent lives in North African deserts, and I think they test bombed their uh, first nuke in one of their colonies, Morocco, a North African desert. China. Uh, they got their first bomb in 1964, and it was codenamed 596. Uh, Layla Thompson, look that one up. I'm not sure why they codenamed it 596. That's your homework assignment. Make sure you email me, sis. India, I like their code name. 1974, their first nuke, they codenamed it Smiling Buddha. Israel, they didn't even give their bomb a code name. Matter of fact, they didn't even reveal to the world that they have nukes, and they never have, but... We all know it because of our intelligence, CIA. They have many nukes, and you're probably wondering why. Well, they're the only Jewish nation surrounded by several Muslim nations in the Middle East that want to wipe them off the face of the earth. So after the Holocaust, their motto has been never again, and they are a very, very militant nation. They're armed to the teeth, so they definitely have bombs. Pakistan, uh, 1998. And their code name was Shigai One. And again, I'm not sure. That sounds like the name of like some exotic cologne for like men going through uh, midlife crisis. Uh, look that one up there, Shigai. Trinity Mitchell, that's your assignment. Look up what their code name, Pakistan's bomb, what it means. North Korea tested their first in 2006. Hey, guys, I don't know if you've been checking the news out. That's crazy in North Korea. They're thinking that Kim Jong-un like he's either dead or he's in a vegetative state. Something happened and the Western media is not sure what happened. Look that up. That's an interesting story going on right now. Iran is currently trying to develop a nuke. They just launched a satellite um, last week, actually. And uh, I think South Africa was the only African nation to have had a bomb. And they have uh, dismantled their bomb since they no longer have a bomb. Uh, so this is the somewhat updated map. It's after the Cold War. It's 2015. But uh, we, you can dismantle nuclear bombs. Once you've created them, you can dismantle them so that they're no longer active. And we have dismantled many. So currently, uh, we still have a lot of bombs. Uh, no worries, kids. We have enough bombs to destroy all life on the planet. Russia has 7,500. We have 7,200. And then you see some of the other nations with bombs there. Okay, so how are you going to protect yourself from a bomb, Riley Hollowell? What's going to happen, man? Are you going to, you know, the missiles come in, you hear the air raid sirens. What are you going to do? Well, there's only one way to protect yourself from a nuclear bomb, and that's to go underground somewhere. And we would call this the bunker. Like I have my bunker right here. I'm in my bunker. 
Uh, the bunker's not a basement. It's, uh, well, I guess it is kind of a basement. It looks like a basement. But in the 1950s, it was usually away from your house, and it was an underground structure. And uh, it's called a fallout shelter because if you survive the immediate blast, you might be like, oh, whew, I survived a bomb. I'm lucky. But what can still kill you is the radiation in the air that's everywhere. It's falling down in these you know, microscopic, these little particles everywhere. You're breathing it in and you're breathing in that radioactivity and that's going to break down your cell structure and you're going to die pretty quickly. So you've got to stay underground for several days, maybe weeks, maybe months until it's safe to go up and breathe the air. Uh, so that's what this fallout shelter is. And if you had enough money and your family was wealthy enough, you could build one. Many fa American families did. I like this, though. Look at the dad. He's just kind of hanging out. And, you know, he's reading the newspaper. And, you know, World War Three has just happened. It's the apocalypse, you know. And they're just going about their daily lives. He's like, hey, baby, while you're in the fridge, go ahead and get me a cold one. And bring me the newspaper. It's cool. All life on this planet is gone. But we in our fallout shelter. Break out the monopoly. Feels like... Uh, Actually, the uh, stay-at-home order, COVID-19. Uh, so fallout shelter was one way. You may have seen these signs around town. I bet some of you have in your grade schools. Uh, this was the public sign that a school or a building had a fallout shelter. Many, many years ago before the war, children, when I taught at North High School, um, and some of you guys who live on North Hill, I think the sign is still outside of North High School. Uh there's a fallout shelter in the basement of North High School. And when I taught history there, I actually took a group of students down into the fallout shelter. It was pretty cool um, because they still had some like uh, boxes down there with blankets. And there were some canned goods from the 1960s, 50s, 60s down there. And it was pretty cool. You had to go down then you had to crawl through this long tunnel. And you came out to this big open area with like underneath the football field that was the fallout shelter for the people on North Hill had there been a nuclear war. And uh, this little slide shows you all the areas that had air raid shelters in Akron during the Cold War. There were 32 air raid shelters in this city, because remember, we were number eight on the hit list. Um, so the University of Akron had a couple, and if you walk through campus, there's still a sign. It's uh, down by Polsky. Also the municipal building down by the police station. There's uh, one down there. Uh, you can look there on that list. There's quite a few. And that's the sign that was outside of North High School there. I think it's still there because we haven't rebuilt North High School. What's going on, kids? That's called duck and cover. Uh, so another thing they told Americans to do during the Cold War, if you didn't have an air raid shelter or you couldn't get to an air raid shelter and you had very little time, you were told to duck and cover like this. Everybody at home do this right now. Duck and cover. It's kind of like tornado drill. They tell you to do this, right? Same idea because you got hurricane force winds coming and buildings are collapsed and everything else. So you're trying to cover up. You're also trying to protect yourself from the light and cover up your skin so that light doesn't burn your skin. Um, and they had a pretty cool cartoon character. His name was Bert the Turtle. And, you know, how are you going to communicate to to a six, seven, eight year old kid. I remember when I was in grade school at Finley Elementary in North Hill, and you know, my second grade teacher tried to explain to us about the nuclear bombs that were out there. And I was terrified. I'm like, she's like, well, there's a bomb. And uh, if the bomb is dropped, uh, it could hurt you. Now I was smart enough in second grade to figure out, you know, a bomb is gonna hurt you. Uh, but then she started telling us how it could hurt us, and I couldn't sleep at night. I kept on thinking, it's going to hit us. It's only a matter of time, and there's nothing you can do to, to save yourself. You know, it terrified me living during the Cold War, having the knowledge that that bomb could be dropped at any time. And even today, we don't think about it, but there's still bombs out there. Many nations have them, and they could use them at any time. And uh, a whole city, blink your eyes, Lydia Graves, blink them, boom, gone. Jada Martin, you think you're small right now? Now you're tiny little particles vaporized like Thanos' snap. So Bert the Turtle was used to kind of communicate this to little boys and girls 
about what you're going to do in case the bomb hits. And Bert was like, don't worry. If you do what I do, you'll be safe. So right below this video is a little short video clip on Bert the Turtle. And they had a cool, catchy song called Duck and Cover. And I want you to watch that video and watch what Bert tells you to do. Okay, children. So that's going to be our lesson for today. Um, there's a Google form to kind of keep you accountable. Um, it's about 12 questions on that Google form. So that'll be due today, tomorrow, 11 p.m., depending on your class. And make sure you watch the video listed below. And do your homework. You're supposed to look up uh, Kim Jong-un. And uh, if you email me what's going on with Kim Jong-un, the latest update, I will give you five bonus points in the grade book. Layla Thompson, I need to know the code name. Don't forget that. That was China's 596. And uh, Mitchell, Trinity Mitchell, you're going to go ahead and look up Pakistan's uh, code name, Shigai1. All right. Ding it a dong, mother scratches. I will see you children sometime later this week. Farewell.